Good morning from London on a rather overcast day with the rain holding off, a slight breeze from the east. Maybe I should say welcome back to a city that's slowly returning to not quite normal, but something more like normal, as it, along with the rest of Britain, starts to recover from COVID. And welcome back to the annual Remembrance Sunday service and march past on Whitehall. What a difference from last year in the middle of the COVID lockdown. This is what the streets looked like then. Deserted, no members of the public here to watch, no march past. Even the troops on parade were few and standing far apart. Today, with most restrictions now lifted, the armed forces, the combined bands and the pipers are going to be back in force. And members of the public who've been waiting since early this morning, lining the pavements around the cenotaph already. And, and most important of all, the veterans are back, already assembling on the parade ground of horse guards and slowly coming through group by group onto Whitehall to take part in the march past. At the heart of the event, this Remembrance Sunday, the two minutes silence at 11 o'clock and the laying of wreaths by the veterans, by senior members of the armed forces, by ambassadors and high commissioners and politicians, and the first wreath to be laid, that of Her Majesty the Queen on behalf of the nation. Her Majesty will not be here as planned this morning. In a statement from Buckingham Palace earlier, they said the Queen, having sprained her back, has decided this morning with great regret that she'll not be able to attend today's Remembrance Sunday service at the Cenotaph. Her Majesty is disappointed that she will miss the service. Uh, we too shall miss seeing her there on the balcony. She is patron of the Royal British Legion, and this year they're celebrating their centenary. They were set up back in 1921, just at the end of the First World War, to care for veterans and their families. And it is the Legion that organizes the March Past, this gathering of those who've either fought in war or are here to remember those who did. And Sophie Rayworth's going to be talking to some of those who come here about their experiences and their memories. There were just 26 veterans who were allowed here on Whitehall last year. And now look at this. What a difference. Thousands of them. And I've been talking to many of them. And there's a real sense of joy of being back here again this year. This camaraderie, the friendship that they have really missed in the past year. And also the public as well. Last year, there, weren't, there was no one allowed here at all. But this year, they have been queuing since 7 o'clock this morning to make sure that they get their place here on Whitehall to watch the march pass. I talked to one woman who had travelled here and she said it is going to be, she felt, even more special this year. It's really important for them, she said, for the veterans, but it is also really important for us. It must have taken a lot of courage and determination for many of them to come here to London in the shadow of COVID, probably many who've had relations, members of the family who've suffered from it, but they have come from across the United Kingdom and abroad, several thousands of them. And others, as the first troops come on to form the hollow square here on Whitehall, others not able to make the journey this morning will be here in spirit. People like Jim Mitchell from Largs in Scotland. A hundred years old this year, he served in the 97th Field Regiment Royal Artillery in the Second World War. He's the last surviving member, member of his regiment. I'm Jim Mitchell. I was born in Yorkshire and I joined the Kent Yeomanry in 1939. I am 100 years and two months. <laughs> I think about the lads that are not with us, that never made it. I'm the last man standing. A great big convoy left from the Clyde here. It was massive. I was on the big lead ship. The Orontes. I think there was about 2,000 soldiers packed on this, and they put in 
hammock. One turned, everybody turned. <laughs> we joined the Indian Division outside Bombay, and then we went to Baghdad. I was in the desert just over a year, thinking miserable. A bottle full of water a day, and that was your day's ration. Too hot for tin helmets anyway. <laughs> Rommel was coming down with these big new tanks for Cairo. As Rommel advanced after we lost to Brook, he was deliberately falling back on El Alamein. El Alamein, that was the big one. They were short of people and they decided to send the 10th Indian Division. The whole division moved. I had a motorbike for getting about on. So I rode the motorbike along the coast over the Sinai Desert, 1,300 miles. We never stopped. I was out with the truck and we were wandering about and we heard this engine going. The Germans are lifting the mines to make a path through to let their infantry through and we started firing at them and eventually chased them. I think we hit a couple of them. They carted them away anyway, and off they went. I, I got uh, mentioned in dispatches. That's this one here. So you got the oak leaves but being mentioned in dispatches. To think about these blokes and say, right, that was tough, Bill. That was tough, Tommy. I get dressed up and I join the British Legion. I, I go down to remember these guys. I think about them. I was one of the lucky ones. A lively hundred-year-old Jim Mitchell there from Largs. So it's difficult to remember that it was only 11 weeks ago, on the 28th of August, that the last UK flight of refugees from Afghanistan left Kabul as the Taliban swept into power. The bands of the Household Division coming on to the parade ground here. Anyone who saw the pictures will never forget those horrifying scenes as families with their children crowded around the Kabul airport, desperate to escape. And the outgoing head of the armed forces, Sir Nick Carter, who's going to be laying a wreath here this morning, said of that abrupt withdrawal, it was heartbreaking to leave so many behind. Sophie spoke earlier to Sergeant Andy Livingston, who was part of the evacuation effort. Sergeant Livingston, how many of those evacuation flights were you involved in? Involved in three in total. Um, two for civilian evacuees and then the final flight was to bring our own troops out. And one of those evacuation flights that took place just after the bomb went off at the, the gates of the airport, it must have been incredibly harrowing to see. It was a really difficult thing to, to be part of, um, whilst it's what we're trained to do is, is get people out of scary places, seeing it, seeing children, um, adults, everyone on board with either cuts or, or bruises or bandages on, it was just nothing can prepare you for it. And the families who were on board, there were an awful lot of children there, weren't there? The majority, um, more, than, more than half of all the passengers that, that I certainly took were, were children. Um, but I've, I've, never known, I've never seen anything like it. It was, you know, mums and dads worried, but children, just being children, excited about getting on a on a plane, which is... And there was one family in particular, the mother, who was just so exhausted, so exhausted, she couldn't even hold her own baby. I don't think this would have been an isolated case. Um, everyone was exhausted, but I remember just being on that particular trip. Um, out the corner of my eye, I see this, this family, there's mum, dad, and three kids, not including the baby. Um, and I see something drop. Um, 
to my right hand side and I was expecting a bag or, or a bottle of water but it was it was their child. Um, I tried my best to get the baby back in her arms and strapped into the, the, the seat. Um, but after after two more times it was it was time to take action and I had to plead with, with mum and dad to say, you know, give me the child, you have a I never sleep anything just you know to to keep yourselves um, okay and it took a bit of persuasion but yeah eventually we, we were okay they had a bit of a rest and and all was good but what do you expect for for a family that's probably been stood in a, in a ditch for for two weeks um, under the most horrible of circumstances with with no no baggage whatsoever harrowing scenes that you witnessed there sergeant livingston thank you very much thank you Now gradually the so-called hollow square forming the Royal Marines on the left there, the Royal Navy and the Household Cavalry Mounted Regiment who are on parade. In front of them, their troop leader, Captain Lord Sullenave, she's the first female officer in the regiment's history. Now this tradition of public commemoration of those who've been killed in war began a year after the armistice, on the 11th of November 1919. Today, that war, the war to end all wars, and all the wars that have followed, the Second World War, never a year without a war, Malaya, Korea, the Falklands, Iraq, Afghanistan, and many others. And each of these wars bringing misery to countless families and civilians across the world, trapped in conflict, and of course to the families of those trained and sent out to fight. Sixteen years ago, during the war in Iraq, two London families heard on the same day that their sons had been killed. Fusilier Stephen Manning of the 2nd Battalion Royal Regiment of Fusiliers and his friend and fellow Fusilier, Donald Mead. We talked to Donald's family. Losing Donald has been like losing a limb, we were very close. He was always just this quiet, calming influence alongside me growing up. But also, always had a really cheeky smile. I miss him immensely. My brother was, was very proud to serve his country and to be in the army. We arrived here in 1996 the volcano on our island of Montserrat erupted and we chose to come here to take refuge. We have these things to remember him by and it actually shows what he meant to the country as well. He thought it was his duty to serve his country and to volunteer uh, to, to go over and, and join the fight in Iraq. Donald phoned home just the day before he died. And during that call, you know, mum asked him to stay safe. And his response was, but I'm a soldier, <laughs> soldiers die. And that's so indicative of his character and his sense of duty. He, he just got on with it. Getting the news was really tough, but preparing to say goodbye to him forever was even harder. In the Caribbean, funerals are a celebration of life, not a dreary occasion. It's to celebrate the full life of an individual. But in this case with Donald, this was a life cut short. He was 20 when he passed away. He would always uh, try and make my mum laugh. Uh, him and my mum got on, got on very well. The news of his death completely broke her. Losing him was was monumental. Um, I'd say that it changed my life forever. Um, he was the male figure in the house, and when he did pass, I kind of had to assume that responsibility. That's what he did, and I wanted to take that responsibility on. Sometimes it's difficult to function. Um, other times you think, let's think of happy memories of him. And it's always, it's always very difficult. 
this Remembrance Sunday will be particularly sad for us because we unfortunately lost our mother this, this year. And for Mum, Remembrance Sunday was about her son. It has become a very personal day. He died without his family around to support him. We thought it was fitting for him to not sleep alone, and who better to have next to you um, than your mum? We always want to make sure that Donald is remembered, not just, you know, for the soldier who gave his life, but as a person, as a human being. The very raw grief of the family of Donald Mead, who died at the age of just 20 in Iraq. Well, I'm joined here by Major Retired Sally Orange, who served with the Royal Army Medical Corps in Afghanistan. It must be very difficult for you today as well. I mean, you work with people as a, as a physiotherapist, but given what you have seen in Afghanistan, it must be difficult. It's very difficult. It's a reminder of those that didn't come back and those who were very seriously injured um, and also the families of those that didn't come back and you know right behind you now at the moment are the children of those fallen heroes and just seeing the grief on their faces and what this means to them for the nation to come together um, and show their support is is immense. You've done an awful lot of work you're marching today with Safa but you've done a lot of work raising money, running marathons, to, to raise awareness of mental health. Why has that been so important for you? The mental health of anybody in society is often affected, particularly by grief. Um, and when you've seen some of the things that you've seen, um, it really does have an impact. And it's really important that we destigmatize de anything that people might think about that and get people to open up and get them to talk because that's what helps them and helps other people as well. And so by running marathons, that's for me how I, how I go about doing that. You've also done a lot of work with the Army Cadet Force, with the young people. We're joined with one, by one of them today, Sophie Dimitrovich. You're going to be marching. You're also going to be laying the wreath. Re yeah. What does it mean to you to be here today? It just brings great honour. Coming down to London to lay the wreath and be marching in front of thousands of people to pay our respects to those who've died and who have came back from both World War I, World War II and any other war that's came along to bring so much honour. Well, you're just 16 years old. Your family must be very proud of you. Thank you both very much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. So the hollow square, as it's called, the old infantry formation is now pretty well in place. In a few moments' time, the music will start, the traditional music. The Coldstream Guards here, yeah. led by Major George Caslett. And he, like many people in the army, has a long history of the, his family working with the Coldstreams. He's an Afghanistan veteran, but he had a grandfather and uncle who both served in the Coldstream, and his younger brother is also serving with them. The band of the Royal Air Force here, led by senior drum major Paul Fellon. And the groups of civilians who come here in uniform also to take their place. The police, British Transport Police for Fire and Rescue Services, you may rescue some of them. The ambulance services, St. John Ambulance, the British Red Cross prison, probation, women's voluntary service, all in uniform, very smartly turned out and shuffling into their position. And the Royal Navy, the Royal Fleet Auxiliaries here, the Royal Marines, the Coast Guard, and the Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Service. detachment leading the parade of the 
Queen Alexander's Royal Naval Nursing Service, Lieutenant Nicky Whitehead worked right through the pandemic, as so many people in the services did, trying to look after colleagues with COVID and arranging all the testing and all that. But the music is about to begin anyway, and it's led by Lieutenant Colonel Simon Hoare, the commanding officer of the Household Division Bands. And it starts, as always, with the stirring notes of Royal Rule Britannia. official march of the Royal Navy there and now the minstrel boy to the war is gone in the ranks of death you'll find him and in June this year a new memorial was unveiled in Normandy to honor those who joined the ranks of death after the invasion of France on D-Day The mass bands of the Household Division stand at ease and the music's taken up by the pipes and drums of the 1st Battalion Scots Guards and the Sky Boats.
Isle of Beauty. Outside Westminster Abbey on Armistice Day, a garden of remembrance is always dedicated with thousands of crosses, each bearing a poppy, these wild red flowers which grew on the devastated battlefields of the First World War and which have become a symbol of remembrance. Hello, Sergeant Gareth Chambers of the Irish Guards, giving the order to the mass bands to stand at ease, and now the pipes and drums play the lament Flowers of the Forest, which was part of the service in 1920 for the unknown warrior at Westminster Abbey. It's been played every year since then, a lament only played at memorial and funeral services traditionally.
And now from Edward Elgar's Enigma Variations, Nimrod, the Hunter. As the last notes of Nimrod fade away, the band turns to play Dido's Lament by Henry Purcell, When I Am Laid in Earth, Remember Me. And in a moment, led by the clergy, those who are going to be here on the parade for the laying of wreaths and the service, and indeed the two minute silence at 11, will start coming out from that building on the right the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. The cross-bearer leading the children and gentlemen of the Chapel Royal and the forces chaplain and the sergeant of the vestry and the sub-dean and the dean of the Chapel Royal, the Bishop of London at the back of this procession, the Right Reverend Right Honourable Dame Sarah Mullally, who will be taking the service. With her crozier there coming out between the two ranks of the Queen's Scouts. A 
and after her, the first of the military, the General Officer who commands London District, Major General Christopher Geeker, with his Chief of Staff and aide-de-camp. the Prime Minister's procession, led by the Prime Minister with the leader of the Labour Party, the Scottish National Party, the Liberal Democrats, Democratic Unionist Party, the Speaker of the House of Commons, House of Lords, Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, the Secretary of State for the Home Department, for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. And behind them, former Prime Ministers, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May. Representative Plaid Cymru will be there. And then behind them, the Secretary of State for Defence, Ben Wallace, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Sajid Javid, the Health and Social Care, Kwasi Kwarteng for Business, Therese Coffey for Work and Pensions. Nadim Zahawi, Secretary of State for Education, and Simon Hart, the Secretary of State for Wales, they find their positions there. And then a third group, the Leader of the House of Lords, and Jacob rees Leader of the House of Commons, and the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. The Chief of the Defence Staff, General Sir Nick Carter, with the First Sea Lord Chief of the Naval Staff, Admiral Sir Ben Key, the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Mark Carlton Smith, the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Mike Wigston. The Irish Ambassador leads out the long procession with the Chargé d'Affaires from Nepal. And then the groups of High Commissioners from all those countries, most of whom sent people to fight in the two world wars or subsequent wars and they will each be laying a wreath and then there are the representatives of different faiths and beliefs 22 representatives who come here to take part in this service.
as I said earlier, the Queen will not be here, as was expected. A statement saying she had sprained her back and with great regret wouldn't be here to attend the service and very disappointed by it, but the Duke of Kent on the left there. Princess Alexandra is there on the royal balcony. And coming out onto horse guards, the Prince of Wales leading the royal party who will be laying wreaths. He lays one on behalf of the Queen first and then his own wreath afterwards. And as they take their place, we wait for under a, a minute until 11 o'clock and the two minute silence.
the last post, sounded by the buglers of the Royal Marines. And now the first of the wreaths, this one being laid on behalf of the Queen by the Prince of Wales in the naval uniform of an Admiral of the Fleet. lays his own wreath with the Prince of Wales feathers in white on it. The Duke of Cambridge comes forward in the uniform of a squadron leader of the Royal Air Force. Earl of Wessex, Royal Honorary Colonel of the Royal Wessex Yeomanry and Armoured Reserve Regiment. The Princess Royal, uniform of an Admiral Chief Commandant for Women in the Royal Navy. Captain James Calder Smith lays a wreath as equerry to the Duke of Kent, who's watching from a balcony above. Princess Alexandra on the right of the balcony there with the Duke of Kent. The parade now stands at ease and the politicians will lay their wreaths. Boris Johnson leading as Prime Minister and he'll be followed by Keir Starmer as leader of the Labour Party. Sir Keir Starmer for the Labour Party and the band plays during this Beethoven's funeral march. Ian Blackford on behalf of the SNP and Plaid Cymru. Sir Ed Davey, leader of the Liberal Democrats.
Sir Jeffrey Donaldson laying a wreath for the Democratic Unionist Party of Northern Ireland. Sir Lindsay Hoyle, Speaker of the House of Commons, and the Lord Speaker, the House of Lords, Lord McFall. Next, on behalf of the security services, the Secret Intelligence Service and GCHQ, two wreaths laid by Elizabeth Truss, the new Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, and Priti Patel, the Home Secretary. The wreaths laid first of all by Crown dependencies and overseas territories. Guernsey, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Anguilla, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, the Falkland Islands, Gibraltar, Montserrat, St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan da Cunha, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. High Commissioners of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Ghana. Almost a million Australians served in the Second World War. From South Africa, 200,000 served in World War I. In World War II, four and a half million were under arms from the Indian subcontinent, from Africa, and from the Caribbean. Three million Commonwealth soldiers in all in World War I. A crucial part of both those wars, which is why they're here laying their wreaths this morning. And now from Malaysia, Nigeria, Cyprus, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Uganda, Kenya, and Trinidad and Tobago. followed by the High Commissioners of Malawi and Malta, Zambia, the Gambia, Guyana, Botswana, Lesotho, and Barbados.
High Commissioners of Mauritius, Eswatini, Tonga, Fiji, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, Grenada, Papua New Guinea, the Seychelles, Dominica, and St. Lucia. last group of High Commissioners from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, from Belize, from Antigua and Barbuda, from the Maldives, St. Christopher and Nevis, Brunei Dar es Salaam, from Namibia, from Cameroon, from Mozambique and Rwanda. Mozambique, a Portuguese colony invaded by Germany in World War I. And Rwanda, part of German East Africa, but now members of the Commonwealth and therefore here laying wreaths. And they'll be followed by the ambassador of Ireland and the chargé d'affaires from Nepal. Ireland, which had 200,000 volunteers in the First World War fighting. Nepal, whose Gurkha forces have always been a major part of the British armed forces, still are today. Chargé d'affaires, Roshan Karnal. And Adrian O'Neill, the Irish ambassador. And next, the service chiefs, the chief of the defense staff, General Sir Nicholas Carter, the first sea lord and chief of the naval staff, Admiral Sir Ben Key, the chief of the general staff, General Sir Mark Carlton Smith, and the chief of the air staff, Air Chief Marshal Mike Wigston. Following them, the representatives of the civilian chiefs, the Merchant Navy, the Air Transport Auxiliary Association, and the civilian services. Lieutenant Commander Leslie Chapman for the Merchant Navy and Fishing Fleets, Derek Smith for the Air Transport Auxiliary Association, and Martin Hewitt for the civilian services. He's chair of the National Police Chiefs Council. And as those wreaths are laid, this formal reef lane comes to an end and Dame Sarah Mullally will conduct the service. God, grant we beseech thee that we who here do honour to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the crown may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives, we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen. Royal Party now are the first to leave Whitehall. They were watched from the balcony by the Duchess of Cornwall, Duchess of Cambridge, and the Countess of Wessex. Colourful sight of the choir of the Chapel Royal. Children of the Chapel Royal, they call they used to travel with the monarch and at the restoration are given these wonderful scarlet and gold cloaks to wear. Bishop of London with her crozier leading the way out. Politicians follow them and the former Prime Minister was John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May there at the back. Present members of the Cabinet.
And down at the Women of the World War II Memorial, Sophie Rayworth is there. While this is going on, let's just join her as we wait for the march past to begin and the laying of wreaths by the Royal British Legion. Yes, thousands of people here now getting ready to take part in that march past. There's a new club taking part in the march past this year as well. It's called the Mert Club. Its founder is squadron leader Sean Pascoe, and he joins me now. Tell us what the Mert Club is and, and why it means so much to you. Well, well Mert is a concept that started in Afghanistan some time ago in response to the kind of number and severity of the, the, the injuries. And, it, and it's effectively a medical team. So uh, uh, we project forward uh, using Chinook, uh, airframe and responded. Uh, there's an emergency medicine uh, physician on board or intensivist, uh, and then uh, any &E nurse and two paramedics, and then the air crew and force protection. And, and as I said, we, we project forward and then retrieve those casualties. Uh, we were hoping to set that team up a, a couple of years ago to kind of march, but obviously with events, um, this is our first outing as, as the club. It is extraordinary the work that you have done there. I mean, you were an A and E nurse. You joined up with the Royal Air Force, and you were really went right in onto the front line under fire often. I think, uh, yeah, I think like like all things in service, I was a small cog in a in a big wheel. So, um, and, and it's an extraordinary team and an extraordinary bunch of people. And I think that some of the the, the, the responses we had to those kind of unexpected survival rates and, and kind of. It, it became quite effective. So um, you saved thousands and thousands of lives, didn't you? I, I think you know, in in total, all over the Afghanistan period, there was in excess of six thousand eight hundred moved by my merit. So and and quite a significant number of those you know, were unexpected survivors. So it had a huge influence on on healthcare, even as it is today, and some of the initiatives that happen, you know, kind of... What does it mean to you to be here today? Because you are going to be marching with people you haven't seen for a long time. It's it's extraordinarily moving and a privilege, particularly after what happened in the last couple of years and our inability to do this. And I think that there is there is something obviously very special for every service person walking past a, a village uh, memorial or monument, but 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 the cenotaph and here today with these extraordinary people, it's, it's really quite special. And given some of the harrowing scenes you, you must have seen, I mean, what do you think of? at 11 o'clock in those two minutes of silence. Uh, interestingly, I, I obviously remember all those that have gone before and gave that ultimate sacrifice, and, and particularly those in Afghanistan. But, but, but I, I, I like to reflect on some of the positives as well. And, and, and I think particularly some of those medical interventions and what we did in Afghanistan had a huge positive impact on everyone now, you know, that actually how we kind of do certain healthcare and, and look after people. So, so there is an air of positive. And I think those people that gave their all would only want us to, to believe and, and, and think that way. Squadron leader, Sean Pascoe, thank you. As the squadron leader was saying, of course, the two minute silence at 11 o'clock and the service here is remembered right across the country today in churches and at memorials. As we come to the next formal part of today's events, the Royal British Legion leading the parade and Lieutenant General James Bashel, who is the president of the Royal British Legion, lays the first wreath. General Bashel was in the Parachute Regiment, commanded the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment and then was commander of Home Command before he became president of the Royal British Legion. The Director General of the Legion exchanges bowler hats with him. And now, Vice Admiral Duncan Potts of the Royal Naval Association. He was an anti-submarine warfare man. The Royal Naval Association has over 11,000 members right across the country and um, looks after their interests when they leave the services. of these, what are called additional leaf laying, Lieutenant General Philip Jones, who's chairman of the Army Benevolent Fund, 
It's the Army's national charity for its soldiers. It supports 60,000 people in 63 different countries around the world. There are many organizations looking after ex-servicemen. It may be sometimes confusing how many there are, but that is the Army Benevolent Fund. He served 36 years in the Army. He was also he's a colonel of the regiment for the Royal Anglian Regiment. Next, to lay a wreath for the Royal Air Forces Association, Air Vice Marshal David Miller Niven. He was a commander of the Joint Helicopter Command around the turn of the century. He joined the RAF in 1968. And this association is one of the oldest of the military charities. For 90 years it's been supporting the Royal Air Force. Remember, the Royal Air Force was first fought in the First World War. And they look after veterans who come out of the services. You see, keep seeing Trevor Boyce, the transport for London. He'll be laying a wreath in a moment at his corner of the shop there. You may wonder why he's standing waiting, but his turn will come because now Colonel Michael Winarik of the Royal Commonwealth Ex Services League lays his wreath. And it's on behalf of five million people from the Commonwealth who volunteered to fight in the Second World War alongside six million British forces. People who weren't called up, didn't have to join, chose to come. A million from Canada, two and a half million from the Indian subcontinent. From South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, the Far East, from across Africa. And the Royal Commonwealth Ex Services League is a, a link for these ex service organizations right across the Commonwealth. And now for the Royal British Legion Scotland, Lieutenant Commander Martin Hawthorne. He was a former instructor officer in the Royal Navy. RBL Scotland celebrating its centenary this year, founded at the same time by Field Marshal Earl Haig as the Royal British Legion. And finally, Trevor Boyce for transport for London. It was George V who said in 1920 that the busmen of London would parade at the Cenotaph along with the armed forces because of the work that they had done in the front, driving the wounded to and from the trenches, or from the trenches, I should say, and uh, 1,500 of them died in World War I. 3,000 in World War II. So Trevor Boyce lays that roof on behalf of Transport for London. So they clear the space in Whitehall. You see the ground around the cenotaph has been swept, but the dead leaves of autumn have fallen to each side as the band marches off to make way, a clear space, I should say, Coldstream Guards band to make space for the massive march past of what we think are maybe 9,000, maybe more, coming past the cenotaph and laying their wreaths today. Back in May 1921, four of the big ex-service organizations came together actually here at the cenotaph and agreed to unite to form a Royal British Legion. And as I was saying earlier, it's their centenary and to market the Queen sent a message writing of a spirit of 
placing service to others before self. A hundred years on, we spoke to people who are going to be taking part in today's March Past who are still absolutely committed to that vision. Service, not self, which is the motto of the Royal British Legion, has always been at the heart of the armed forces. Service to others is part of your uh, military nature, really. I served as an LGBT plus person in the armed forces. And I work for Fighting with Pride as the joint CEO. It's a charity that supports LGBT plus veterans plus serving personnel. The motto serves to self is very important because of the amount of veterans that are now leaving from conflicts such as Iraq, Afghanistan. I'm a former Royal Marine Commando, I haven't served 25 years. In 2007, I was serving in Afghanistan and one of my Marines was seriously injured with a improvised explosives device, losing both legs and, and an arm. He was one of my guys and I was very keen on seeing his progress and seeing him getting better and, you know, I wanted to be part of that recovery. The Merchant Navy Association is a group of merchant seamen. I talk to a lot of members who are in their 80s and 90s and in some cases live alone or live in, in homes and so we can discuss stories of things that we got up to at sea. It's so pleasing to, to hear the change in their voices. Marching at Cenotaph this year is really important for Fighting With Pride. It's the first time that LGBT plus people have marched together. LGBT veterans who were dismissed before the ban was lifted were told that they couldn't wear their berries. They had their medals taken away from them. And they're all coming together to be part of the military family again. This year will be the first year that the Kazivak Club will be marching. It's a club for servicemen and women that have been injured and were then actually extracted from Iraq or Afghanistan. This year I'll be marching with the Royal Marines Association, which is the first time I've marched since leaving the Royal Marines, and I will be very proud, extremely proud. The March Pass is very important to the Merchant Navy Association. It, it shows that we are part of the, the armed forces. When I first joined the uh, Royal Air Force, um, I became a navigator on F-4 Phantoms Air Defence Fighters, and it was just an amazing role. And it was a really uh, top gun environment. But I already knew my gender identity conflicted, and I had to hide that. And there was no support around me. That's what made me stand up and say, well, it wasn't there for me, so um, how can I help other people? During my first operational tour to Iraq, I was quite seriously injured. Three roadside bombs were detonated against our vehicles, uh, and I lost my right arm. You know, I was lucky. I survived it. My driver, unfortunately, didn't survive it, um, and that lives with me every day. I was awarded the Military Cross, which for me is more a recognition of unit and team pride uh, than it is for individual effort. I was tasked to go into Headley Court as a Sergeant Major to look after the welfare, the discipline of the guys. I was there as a father figure, if you like. Some of the injuries that you've seen at Headley Court were quite mind-blowing, if you like. Part of my role would be taking the guys and girls out for meals. It was very important for them just so they could have some normality. My dad was uh, joined the Merchant Navy back in 1940, but unfortunately his ship was torpedoed and lost. My father did survive. If it hadn't have been for that, I, I wouldn't be here now. On Remembrance Day, it is very important to remember merchant seamen a lot didn't have graves to go to. They're at the bottom of the sea. And so it's our way of recognising and appreciating the efforts and the service that they did to this country. I think the act of remembrance is incredibly important, just so that we continue to learn lessons of the past. I'm honouring and remembering all of those that paid the ultimate price, not just uh, people from World War I and World War II, but close friends and colleagues who have been lost in more recent wars. I've lost quite a lot of friends in the Marines. I will be thinking about all of them and their loved ones on the day. The freedoms that we have today are built on the sacrifices of people that have come before us.
waiting now for the band of the Coldstream Guards to lead the march past. 9,000, we think, veterans assembled here. And not all veterans, the families as a boy of 11 going to be here, remembering his great-grandfather, the wives of servicemen who were killed, husbands of women killed. So the Coldstream Guards leads off the parade, and it is this year the turn of the Royal Air Force to take pride of place at the front. Sixth Squadron of the Royal Air Force, formed in 1914, lead off, followed by members of the Bomber Command, Seven Squadron Association, the Nine Squadron Association, the oldest dedicated bomber squadron in the Royal Air Force. come past the cenotaph and eyes left and at the front of each contingent a wreath bearer who hands the wreath to the assistants there you can see the wreaths being handed and laid around the foot of the cenotaph until it will be a complete carpet on top is the Royal Air Force Survival Equipment Association there Responsible for the important business of packing parachutes and safety equipment. Royal Air Forces Association. The Royal Air Force Regiment Association will provide protection for the Royal Air Force at their bases and airfields around the world, preventing ground forces or air forces attacking. The RAF Regiment Gunners have been on active service, fought in every major and minor conflict since they were formed, uh, I think apart from Korea. The Women's Royal Air Force Branch of the Royal Air Force Association, their blue scarves, formed in 1918 and disbanded in 19. 94 when they merged with the Royal Air Forces. The ex Prisoners of War Association, Bob Ankerson leads it, ejected from a tornado and kept prisoner during the first Gulf War. The Air Sea Rescue and Marine Craft Section of the Royal Air Force, formed in 1918 again, with high-speed launches to rescue pilots whose planes had ditched in the channel. And they don't think that in uh, the Second World War, more than 13,000 aircrew and civilians were saved. The Royal Air Force Police Association, the Snowdrops, with their white service caps, celebrating the first 100 years of the RAF police this year. The RAF police, of course, doing their duty in keeping the other members of the RAF in line. The Royal Observer Corps Association is behind them. And the Air Sea Rescue and Marine Craft section, they may have seen with their white roll neck sweaters under their club blazers. Now the Women's Association, the Women's Royal Air Force, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, and the women in the RAF. Women first recruited into the Royal Air Force back in 1918. As always, we can't, of course, mention all these contingents. There are so many of them, some 30, 40, 50 strong, some two or three or four people only. So forgive us if your particular Association isn't mentioned, but we'll mention as many of them as we can. 
and we'll also be talking to people taking part with Sophie Rayworth. Let's join her. Sophie, over to you. There is a wonderful atmosphere down here in the middle of the March Pass. People cheering, singing, clapping as, as the March Pass goes by. I'm joined by Barbara, Barbara McGregor, who served with the Royal Navy. Another round of applause. There is a real sense of just joy, isn't there, that people can be back here again. It is, so It's simply wonderful to see everybody here again, looking so well, just coming back to remember all the people who are falling in the service of our country. It means so much to people, though, to be Absolutely here on Remembrance it Sunday. It really, really does. It's a huge effort to get everybody here this year. You serve with the Royal Navy. Navy. You have an extraordinary title, don't you? The longest serving woman in the Royal Navy in the Guinness Book of Records. It is, Sophie. I actually joined the Women's Royal Naval Service and we were amalgamated into the Royal Navy in 1993 and I've just been awarded the Guinness Book of Records for the longest serving female in the Royal Navy, 43 years and 189 days. You must have seen an awful lot of change in the Royal Navy during that time. Absolutely, so many things have changed, especially the opportunities for women in the Royal Navy. They can now join the Royal Navy in any role that they wish, and I believe that's for the whole of the armed forces as well. And you're going to be marching with the Wrens very shortly. I am. What does it mean to you to be leading them today? I'm so honoured to lead them. I've done this for 10 years, and I'm so honoured. And everybody looks to you to guide them, especially those who have never done this before. It's a terrific honour. And so many people who wanted to be here, just 26 veterans were allowed to be here this time last year. And to see so many back here, we thousands. Really, we really missed being here last year. It was to, it's really, really good for us to come back this year, Sophie. Really, really grateful. Barbara McGregor, thank you. Thank you. The Royal Hospital of Chelsea. Outstanding figures in their scarlet tunics and tricorn hats, founded by Charles II. And uh, they have both men and women now who give up their pensions and take up residence there and care for veterans, a hospital home for disabled ex-servicemen and women in Worthing. 98-year-old veteran Len Gibbon marching with them who was on Gold Beach in 1944. British Limbless Ex Servicemen's Association, Lesma. And the British Ex Services Wheelchair Sports Association, founded to support those who take up sport and to help rehabilitation of veterans. Look at those badges there on the can't identify all of those badges, I'm afraid. The Green Berets of the Commando Association formed after 1940 to do hit and run raids and work behind enemy lines. Tough guys. The War Widows Association who laid their wreath not today but yesterday because originally they weren't allowed as women to lay a wreath oh, at the cenotaph and when they were told they could they said no we'll stick with our old position and we'll lay it on a Saturday they had a special service here on Saturday Trishal Oman scouts just disappearing there with their red and white shemags and see black rope a ghoul holding them in place and the little silver Kunja dagger badge. Sophie, yours. I'm joined here by Rob Long, who is going to be marching very shortly with the Special Observers Corps. 
it's a very big moment for you. Explain what happened to you in Afghanistan. Uh, on July the 8th, 2010, my patrol commander, Sam Robinson, uh, triggered an IED, which resulted in his death, and um, my left eye was blown out on the battlefield, and then my right eye had to be removed when I got back to the UK, so I've been totally blind ever since. You've taken part in the march pass before, but this is the first time you've marched with your association, isn't it? So this will be the first time I've marched with the, the special observers since my medal ceremony from uh, coming back from Afghan. So it's a hugely important moment for me before I've been marching with Blind Veterans UK as part of their contingent. And you're here today with Andy Bainbridge, who is marching with you. You're his guide, but you've been practicing. We have, Sophie. We've uh, practiced down in Rob's land and also along the mall this morning. I think Rob's going to be my excuse for being out of step today. <laughs> How's it been? How's it been the practicing? Uh, fantastic. So it's, it's it's quite tactile. I can feel his movements and his step through holding his shoulder. But also, I've been uh, doing jiu-jitsu for the last five years, so I'm quite practiced at feeling people's movements and uh, and what they get up to. You uh, mentioned jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You don't just do jiu-jitsu. You're a, you're a sort of world champion para jiu-jitsu. You're top in Europe. That's been incredibly important, hasn't it, for you and your recovery? Uh, massively. It's, um, I've been working with the British Army Brazilian jiu-jitsu team for the last five years, and. Um, now I'm at a stage where I'm ready to start giving that skill set back to, to other soldiers who've suffered life-altering injuries. Um, it's been huge for me going from a frontline soldier in, in Afghan to, to being completely, you know, needing someone to help me walk down the street is, you know, jiu-jitsu has given me, given me my life back, basically. Well, I really look forward to seeing both, both of you take part in the March Fast so, today. Thank you so much for you. taking the time to talk to us. Chindit Society in their Australian slouch hats. There was a big contingent of them going through a moment ago. Alice Wingate, granddaughter of the famous General Wingate, who commanded the Chindits behind Japanese lines, is on parade here. They'll always be in England. The band plays. They turn away from that traditional, rather formal music to play popular tunes that were well known to the forces during this march past to keep them on the go. There are an amazing number of people in their 90s and even a hundred marching past. This is the Kazivak Club, marching for the first time and it's uh, formed just a few years ago to look after people seriously wounded in combat, losing legs, limbs, arms, and they're followed by the MERT Club, Emergency Medical Evacuations. catch sight of Captain Ibra Ali who was in our film a moment ago there. Fighting with pride, marching for the first time. The first openly serving transgender officer in the British Armed Forces is co-founder of this organization. We saw her, there she is, uh, a moment ago talking about how she had transitioned. And this is the UK's only LGBT plus military charity formed just last year. The Royal Marines Association in their Green Berets. Again, Robert Toomey, who was talking to us earlier. Led by their chairman, a former Royal Marine and Falklands veteran. Around on horse guards, the Duke of Cambridge is taking the salute. The 
Secretary of State for Defence on his right. As the march past goes down to the bottom of Whitehall, it turns and comes round and the salute is taken on horse guards. The Merchant Navy Association and the Queen Alexandra's Royal Naval Nursing Association originated way back in the Crimean War when Eliza Mackenzie, a nurse, was sent by the Admiralty to the Naval Hospital, 1854 that was. Royal Naval Communications Association, the Physical Training, the Submariners, Photographers Association, Royal Naval Clearance Divers Association, they're all, every, the Clearance Divers Association whose job is to clear ports and harbours and beaches of unexploded mines and booby traps. 600 members, it's grown in recent years. Behind them, Ganges Association, the training association or establishment for the Royal Navy and other organizations. The St. Vincent Association, for tr those trained at uh, HMS St. Vincent. And then various associations attached to ships. If you're in the Royal Navy, you are very close to those you serve with on a ship and Many of them have formed their association so that they can meet up from time to time and perhaps meet here annually at the Cenotaph. It's as always a very impressive sight. My goodness, what a change from last year. They must be so relieved to be here, as they've been saying to Sophie Rayworth, to come and pay tribute. It's really important to make this journey to London with all the difficulties of COVID and the rest of it, to be here, to meet up with people you fought with or served with, and to pay tribute to those who died with this sea of wreaths being laid. I was talking about ships. This is the Type 2 Association for eight Type 2 Amazon-class warships in the Royal Navy. Two of them lost in the Falklands War, Ardent and Antelope. Very powerful ships, known as the Porsche of the fleet because they had the same engines as Concorde had. So this is a section from the Royal Navy and the Fleet Air Arm coming through, Fleet Air Arm Association, the aviation branch, of course, of the Royal Navy, formed back in 1909. The Type 42 Association, the 14 Type 42 destroyers, they were formed as an organization in 2010 and have one and a half thousand or more members. Air Arm Field Gun Association, the Green Blazers passing through. They used to take part in those competitions at the Royal Tournament that have now come to an end. Any Face Association marching for the first time for people who served in the airborne early warning system, Any Face was the code word for a friendly aircraft. They call themselves the Any Face Association, but their job was to spot ships come uh, planes coming in hostile aircraft coming in when radar wasn't that sophisticated and this job was of real importance you see how people cluster accumulate around their own particular speciality so one thinks of one royal navy one air force one army but actually it's all made up in these ways. The band of the Scots Guards now, 
marching off and leading the Blind Veterans UK. So that band wheeling away and leading the Blind Veterans. Its chairman, the wreath is being laid by the Vice President Billy Baxter, a former Royal Army Staff Sergeant who lost his sight in 1997 in Bosnia. They're normally the, one of the biggest contingents. This year they are much smaller because they say of COVID. But Blind Veterans UK supports 5,000 or more blind veterans, most of them over 70. And of course, during the pandemic, they've been under particular risk, that particular risk. Cambridge again, taking the salute. And they pass by him and then really come off parade behind there on horse guards where they began this morning. That's the site of horse guards where the annual Trooping the Colour ceremony takes place, the guards memorial against the autumn trees in the background. Royal Scots Regimental Association. It's one of the oldest regiments in the British Army and had over a hundred thousand men serving in the First World War, of whom over half were casualties. It has nearly 150 battles honours. The Black Watch Association with their Red hackles on the blue bonnet. Raised in 1725 to police the Highlands, fought at Passchendaele, amalgamated in the Royal Regiment of Scotland in 2006. Behind them, the King's Own Royal Border Regiment. Regiment which uh, went to the support of William of Orange when he landed at Bay when James II was deposed. Many of these Scottish regiments, like the infantry who we'll see later, have been merged into the Royal Regiment of Scotland, but they still retain their identities, particularly here, because their identities was what distinguished them during the First and Second World Wars and in subsequent wars, and the merging of regiments always causes some discomfort, unhappiness. In the name of efficiency, it's done, and they do their best to maintain their old traditions. Blue and white hats of the Royal Danish Embassy of the Wreath reads, small delegation from Denmark. And uh, at that point, let's rejoin Sophie Rayworth, who's now on Horse Guards. Sophie. Yes, I'm here on Horse Guards with all the veterans now who are returning, having taken part in the march past, past the Cenotaph. Huge applause still as they take their places back here. I'm joined by Lieutenant Commander Serena Brotherton from the Royal Navy, who has set up a new association which has just taken part in the March Pass for the first time today, the Anyface Association. Explain what it is and why it's called that. Um, yes, Sophie. So the Anyface Association, Anyface is the code word for friendly airborne early warning um, aircraft. And we set the squadron up uh, last year for personnel who have contributed to the Royal Navy's airborne early warning since 1952. That was primarily through 849 Naval Air Squadron. Tell us more about the work that the squadrons do. So uh, traditionally, um, AEW Naval Airborne Early Warning is from a ship, uh, based from a ship, an aircraft with a very strong radar who will get airborne, who will provide surveillance around the task group, 
and importantly early detections of any incoming threat aircraft to the task group. Uh, we then have done maritime surveillance as well and then back in 2009 we were actually sent to Afghanistan uh, because we realised during the telec operation we could use the radar not only in the air and the maritime but also over the land. There so we used it in Afghanistan um, in Helmand. There have been a few new associations that we've, we've seen today. What, how important is it for veterans to, to be able to be part of that and to come here? I mean, it's just so incredibly important, uh, particularly for us, um, 849 Naval Air Squadron decommissioned last year. And we just wanted to, to keep its heritage, to continue the community spirit that we had built up, and also to ensure that we'd rem always remember those that we had lost. So it's just really important for us to have this association and to come together and to be here to, to honour the war dead and to honour our veterans as well. And you talk of community spirit, the camaraderie here, particularly yeah. this year, is, is quite something, isn't it? Oh, it, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, such a poignant occasion. And obviously you've got the, the mix, sort of um, the sombre reflection, and then you get the camaraderie, the banter, you know, all these veterans just bursting with pride. And then seeing the general public 10 deep applauding is just so heartwarming. And I think it's just, it's fantastic. And I'm really proud that this country collectively comes together every year to, to honour our war dead and to, you know, to, you know, to look after our veterans and to, and to honour them. Lieutenant Commander Serena Brotherton, thank you. Thank you, Sophie. a reference there to the pride and enthusiasm and importance of this march past. This is the Rifles and Royal Gloucestershire, Berkshire and Wiltshire Regimental Association, carried by two Korean War veterans who survived the Battle of Imjin River, their wreath. And today, this very day, three unknown soldiers from the Gloucesters who fought at Imjin his bodies were only recently discovered are being buried with full military honours in Korea in the presence of the Korean Prime Minister. The London Regiment Association is the only reserve regiment in the Guards Division, providing infantry soldiers to reinforce all five regiments of the Foot Guards. Now, the next column, mainly made up of members of the army, the lifeguards, the Blues and Royals, the Royal Dragoon Guards, the Royal Horse Artillery, the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, the Queen's Royal Hussars, the 16th, 5th Queen's Royal Lancers, the 17th, 21st Lancers, the Death or Glory Boys. The Light Dragoons Regimental Association went to Bosnia-Herzegovina shortly after the amalgamation with the regiment and squadrons serving there for 13 tours during that time. They were preceded by the King's Royal Hussars and the Royal Lancers, the Queen Elizabeth's own. As they pass through, let's go back for a moment on to Horse Guards and rejoin Sophie. I'm joined by one man who has taken part over the years, many, many years now. You've been coming here to the Cenotaph from the RAF ex-prisoners of war, Robbie Stewart. Thank you very much for talking to us. How was it for you today? It was lovely. It was lovely to be back after two years' absence. And it was great to see everybody marching as well. It's always uh, a moment in when you're just before you start to march when it's suddenly very quiet. And that's when you remember. Uh, unfortunately for us all, the World War II guys are not here anymore. So remember them. 
but also we remember the guys who allow us to be here in the first place. So it's a, it's a big thing. You were taken prisoner of war in 1990... 1991. 1991, during Gulf War One. You were shot down, a navigator with the RAF. Tell us what happened. Well, it was the 19th of the first, 91, and uh, our mission, uh, it was our second mission, uh, to drop the JP-233 on a runway. And as we headed in, uh, a missile came hurtling towards us. In fact, I think I just made a mistake. It was uh, not a JP attack. It was 1,000 pounders against AAA. And uh, we were running in, and suddenly there was a, a missile heading straight towards us. We tried to evade, uh, and unfortunately couldn't. And it exploded right next to us and knocked the pilot unconscious. And automatically, I just ejected and we got out safely. And you were held for nearly three months, wasn't it? With the yes. Very badly injured as well, a shattered leg, terrible injuries. Yes, I had my leg was broken. Uh, in fact, when I woke up in the morning, because I was unconscious as well, I suddenly looked down and I could see blood around my leg. And I thought, what can I do? I, I can't get out of here. Because I, I did a lot of escape and evasion training, and I thought I could do that, but not with a broken leg. Mm. And uh, I had a little um, radio on me, so I pulled that out and I, I tried to contact the aircraft above me, but there was no joy. And then a, a wagon appeared out in the middle of nowhere, and these guys got out. And they were very kind, they were Iraqis, and they saw me, and one of them actually uh, took his headscarf and he tied it around my leg um, to my other leg, and then they took me away. And your family had no idea what had happened to you, did they, in that time? No, and it was a worrying time for them, of course, um, and they didn't really know what had happened to me. Uh, there was all sorts of reports. Um, but then eventually, I think, the Iraqis themselves said they had captured me. So I was alive, but so that was good, at least. And you have come back here almost every year since then to the Cenotaph. What was it like last year when you couldn't come here? Yes, very sad. Um, as I say, we, we missed seeing all the guys. Um, it's, it's a lovely thing to do every year to come back here and see them. But of course, what we didn't realise when we came back from the Gulf, that uh, we suddenly were part of this RAFX POW Association. And all these guys from the Second World War, lovely, they took us in, part of their family. Uh, and it was really fantastic. And although it's a strange organisation to be part mm, of, they, they don't really want new members. We were, and they looked after as well. An extraordinary bond for you yes, all. Yes. Robbie Stewart, thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Army dog unit from Northern Ireland they played a major part in Operation Banner in Northern Ireland. They don't have their dogs with them, but they searched areas affected by bomb blasts looking for arms and explosives. They had guard dogs, they had tracker dogs. The dog's leads worn diagonally around their chests. Followed by the Dental Corps, the Intelligence Corps. The Women's Royal Army Corps Association, WRAC. Intelligence Corps Association. Originally they were officers only. One of them was John Buchan, who wrote the famous spy novel, The 39 Steps, and they played a big part in breaking the Enigma Code. The Glider Pilot Regiment Society, the first time they'd marched as a society. 97-year-old Brian Latham in the wheelchair, his first march pass took part in Operation Varsity in 1945 with the largest airborne assault in World War II. He remembers it as probably the most exciting and most frightening day of his life. 
And he then went on to the relief of the Belsen concentration camp. The Royal Army Chaplain's Department follows them, marching for the first time. And they're followed by the coronation intake. It's the last time they're going to be marching, the coronation intake from the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. as the Royal Ulster Constabulary George Cross Association recognised in 1985 and they were serving there as the most dangerous police force in the world. Over 300 members of the RUC were killed during the Troubles. They're followed by the Metropolitan Special Constabulary see with their checkered black and white caps National Association of Retired Police Officers. The British Evacuees Association, the labels on their lapels, the children, three and a half million of them, sent away from the Blitz with labels saying their names and often going to places they didn't know, to people they didn't know and maybe coming back to find their families had gone. Scottish little soldiers, the newly formed, the children of people who had lost a parent in war. Founded just over 10 years ago. And they try and do something for the young people. They've got 45 of them marching today. Among the 13 year old who was only nine weeks old when his father was killed in Afghanistan. But they give them presents, take them away for their birthdays. Very sad sight. Lieutenant General Bashel, the national president of the Royal British Legion on the right there, Duke of Cambridge, and the Secretary of State for Defence taking the salute and let's rejoin Sophie. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined here at Horse Guards Parade by Robbie Robertson, who I met before. This time I met him, met you last year. VJ Day 75 commemorations, which, like last year, were very, very scaled down, weren't they, because of the yes. pandemic. You were there, though. I was Back this year, yes. thousands of people here. What has it been like for you today? Well, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see all this crowd, especially the young people. You know, and uh, they, they seem to applaud and um, you, something you don't come across nowadays, you know. And, There's a and real, young sense, people, yeah. real sense of appreciation for, yes. for veterans like you. You were marching with the Chindits, you were the, the special forces who yes, did extraordinary work in the yes. Second World War, yes. going in behind enemy lines in Burma. You Tell us about some of the, the work that you did, because it was, it was awful conditions, wasn't it? Yes, um, well, I was a wireless operator mechanic, so I had to send the signals and also maintain the equipment. You know. um, and um, we were responsible for contacting uh, these all sources in India that was to supply us. And uh, number one air commando, which was a private little air force, U.S. Air Force, which was set up to support the changes, and uh, I had to communicate with them. Because the soldiers, they relied on you entirely, didn't they? they you were their way of getting food. You That's had to. Right. They had five days of supplies on their backs. Yeah. You had to get the messages in to the air crew to get the, the supplies dropped in. So without you, yeah. they were in trouble. And not only supplies, but any air support and to get the wounded out if, uh, if possible. 
sometimes were good, unfortunately. But uh, that's it. And uh, it was, I, I must confess, never being in danger. I didn't think I was in danger. Um, you know, uh, my vision to the army, who uh, really uh, kept me safe, feeling safe. <laughs> but uh, you would have thought, you know, in the end, you got, I don't know why. It's quite safe and um, um, it's hard to say that um, I had expected to well, follow them. It is wonderful to see you here today, Robbie. You're 97 years old. Yeah. Um, and it's fantastic to see you taking yeah. part in the March Fast today. Thank you so much. Yeah, 98 in two weeks. 98 time. in two weeks, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. I bet he'll be here when he's a hundred. The Army Cadet Force now, led by Major Stacy Watson, commanding officer for this event. She was nominated Commandant, and Sophie spoke earlier to Sophie Dimterich, who will be handling the wreath. The oldest one marching in the Army Cadet Force, only 19 years old, the youngest. 14 years old. We saw her there, she's with her spectacles earlier this morning. So we're now into the youth contingent. And one of the um, veterans was saying how wonderful it was to see so many young people here. And there is a big contingent of young people from the Sea Cadets, the Army, the Royal Air Force Air Cadets, the Combined Cadet Forces. Boys Brigade, the St. John Ambulance Cadets, the Girls Brigade, the Jewish Lads and Girls Brigade, the Scouts, Girl Guiding, Police Cadets, Church Lads, Fire Cadets, and the YMCA. The Scout Association, and very young members in pale blue, just about keeping in step. There are half a million scouts in the United Kingdom and there are 50 million around the world. Sometimes it gets forgotten what a huge organization it is. Cadets for the St. John Ambulance helped during the year of COVID. Volunteering with the provision of vaccine when it was available. The YMCA, the easily distinguished wreath there, the oldest youth charity they say in the world. They support over half a million young people every year. And uh, in the war, they went to assist the armed forces. They got official recognition from the War Graves Commission. Then they received military and civilian honors. Church lads and church, church girls brigade, very smart. In their blue uniforms. And the fire cadets. I don't know whether we'll be able to see the fire cadets, but they have a wreath which is actually made from a fire hose used in operational incidents rather than from poppies. Fire hose made in the shape of poppies, I assume. Still the armed services lining the route there.
So this march past is a parade and hence the Duke of Cambridge taking the salute of the various contingents as they go past. They go down Whitehall and round the bottom of the Treasury Building and then back up onto Horse Guards. So this is the, I was going to say tail end, but that's not the right to, the way to put it. It's the coming towards the end of the march past. By no means the tail end, because everybody who marches here, of course, is important. And Sophie, who's been talking to veterans uh, throughout this morning, from before the ceremony ever began until now, as people have been marching down Whitehall, and has met many of them informally and here during this program. Let's rejoin her, Sophie. And thousands of veterans returning here now to Horse Guards Parade, where they began first thing this morning. People have come from all over the country, all over the world, to be part of this march past today. And I've really been struck by the the sense of camaraderie here, the relief that they can all be back here together to be here for what is such an important moment, to remember those who have been lost. Great friendship, great camaraderie, and a lot of applause as all these veterans come and pay their respects, and the public too, a huge appreciation for the amount of applause and the number of people who turned out this morning in Whitehall. Well, it is, of course, a a cheerful moment for many of the people who come here to meet their friends, but it's also been a very solemn morning of Remembrance Sunday with the two-minute silence and the service. And now a field of poppies surrounding the Cenotaph, poppies in remembrance of thousands upon thousands killed in the two world wars and all the world since. Just that simple poppy. It's a symbol that was inspired by the words of a Canadian surgeon and poet, John McRae, who was moved by the sight of these wild flowers springing up on the wasteland of the battlefields of Flanders in Belgium in 1915. And this is what he wrote. In Flanders' field, the poppies grow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders' field. 